You mentioned alcohol before. Yeah. Given the high percentage of calories coming from hyperpalatable foods and your understanding, I guess, of how this is affecting physiology, can we say that a large percentage of adult Americans are addicted to food? Is there such a thing as food addiction? And are we talking about a psychological addiction or a physical dependence, physical addiction? I really appreciate this question. I'm, I'm really glad you asked it because um, there is, and I, I like to make a very clear distinction between the premise that some foods may be very highly rewarding um, and may have um, addictive properties. Um, and that is distinct from the sort of clinical premise of food addiction um, as kind of a clinical syndrome that substantially influences somebody's functioning in their daily life. So, and those things are, so those things are quite different. And, and to pull in the corollary with alcohol again, right? Like alcohol, um, you know, it, various alcoholic beverages, we can, con you know, consider them substances in a way that, you know, um, alcohol has specific psychoactive effects and can garner addiction among vulnerable individuals, but in and of itself, it's a substance. And so in, in some sense, I kind of, the, the premise around hyperpalatable foods is similar because like foods themselves, like the hyperpalatable foods themselves can be kind of viewed from a substance lens where um, they can garner addictive um, kind of behavioral traits or compulsive consumption among vulnerable people but on the whole are the are you know distinct as like a substance so um and in the, and we see this again with with alcohol um in the US population the vast majority of adults say that they drink alcohol like they currently drink in some form a lot of that is very low level and the percentage of individuals who exhibit um, like problematic drinking or risky drinking or a full alcohol use disorder are much, much lower um, than the amount of adults who are exposed to alcohol. So um, so therein, you know, is kind of the distinction between like, you know, a lot of individuals can engage with alcohol, um, but for and for most of them, they will not become addicted. Um, and it's available and, you know, kind of pretty widely in the population uh, or, you know, you know, in our environment. But in and we see like, you know, around 20 percent or less who exhibit like risky drinking behavior in some form that could, um, you know, garner like alcohol problems. So if we. Liken that to food, you know, like hyperpalatable foods as a substance, most of the population, if not everybody, you know, has had exposure to these foods. They're extremely difficult to avoid, even when you're trying to. Um, but we, we know that um, from some really excellent work, um, my colleague Ashley Gerhardt at the University of Michigan has really um, studied the, the phenomenon of food, of, um, food addiction and has demonstrated that like this does seem to be a significant problem. But again, um, you know, roughly around uh, 20 percent, I think, relative to like basically the entire population that has been exposed to these foods. You know, so does that help to kind of yeah. contextualize? That, that, that yeah. makes me wonder a few things. One, what makes someone vulnerable? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it biology, genetics? Is it socioeconomic status, education? And is it the same things that make someone vulnerable to alcohol? Is there a lot of overlap with what would make someone vulnerable to food food addiction? Yeah, great question. So the first question regarding like what makes individuals vulnerable, um, again, we can kind of take from the addiction literature and I, and I reference kind of a lot the addiction kind of science area um, and because we kind of, you know, I'm, we use that to understand, you know, um, well, food addiction, for one, is based directly off of the substance use disorder criteria, um, although it's not considered like a 
um, clinical diagnosis yet in the um, in our uh, diagnostic criteria, but there's a lot that is kind of inferred from that area to help us understand and like the theories and the mechanisms behind what might be going on here. So um, informed from that area and you know what we have seen from the um, from the kind of um, food space is that you know yes individuals um, some have. Um, neurobiological vulnerabilities, um, and um, other others may have like trait-based factors that can increase their um, their risk for kind of um, uh, propensity to consume these types of foods. For example, they may be particularly sensitive to the the reward. Um, you know, that they experience when consuming these foods. Um, other times, like, yeah, certainly the, the issue of like, um, you know, bringing up socioeconomics and um, thinking about um, the kind of structure and the degree of um, like uh, socioeconomic inequities in the United States. We know that a lot of individuals have, um, you know, live in, um, in environments where they have um, low uh, food security or food insecurity, so they don't have enough, you know, food to eat on a regular basis to um, function. And in these environments, um, that uh, people, what people have most available is these hyper palatable foods because they're the basically the cheapest to purchase in the U.S. food supply. And so there is a structural inequity um, that forms the basis of that. That that likely increases. Um, you know, the um, kind of vulnerability to having to consume these regularly because there's just no other alternative. And then that may make it difficult for, for people. Hey friends, the scientific evidence on lifestyle habits that lead to longevity is clear. Now it's time to put this knowledge into action. I'm excited to announce the Living Proof Longevity Challenge, a 12 week program to build evidence-based lifestyle habits to optimize longevity. My team and I have transformed over hundreds of hours of conversations with experts on aging, nutrition, and exercise into a life-changing 12-week program that will challenge you to develop habits that lead to a longer, better life. This is a unique opportunity to gather health data about yourself that has the potential to change your life for the better. You'll start by testing 10 longevity biomarkers that tell the truth about where your longevity stands right now, today. Following that, you'll get a personalized longevity score to guide your 12 weeks of habit building that will boost your score and improve your biomarkers for the better. After the challenge, you'll retest your 10 biomarkers and see the proof of how powerful these science-backed habits really are. Head over to theproof.com forward slash living proof to download your zero cost copy of the Living Proof Longevity Challenge today. That's theproof.com forward slash living proof. Look forward to joining you on this journey. What about the, I guess, the mental health status of the population? I have to wonder if someone is experiencing depressive symptoms or anxiety, are they going to be more vulnerable turning to certain hyperpalatable foods to get that kind of instant relief? Even though it's very self-defeating, I guess, in the long run, it, it could be making their mental health worse certainly their physical health but do you think that the i guess the happiness of the nation plays a role in the consumption of hyper palatable foods and then that makes me wonder if you were to remove hyper palatable foods do people start to look elsewhere hmm. i think in terms of the type of temporary relief that these foods can provide individuals um it, it, we certainly have seen um, through scientific research that eating these types of foods to cope with like stress or negative emotions um, is it can certainly be a risk factor for, you know, kind of consuming these types of foods a lot. Sometimes um, that can lead to like um, uh, binge eating and things like that. Um, and, and yeah, for others, you know, eating to, you know, to cope may, you know, be kind of a response that, um, um, a behavioral, you know, kind of, um, 
piece of the repertoire that, you know, people seek out these foods to help ameliorate or anxiety or things like that. But I think that I think that the premise that, you know, these foods can be so rewarding is um, it's a concerning point because they are so easy to turn to. You know, like they're everywhere um, and they're cheap, you know, and and so I think that that is certainly um, part of the problem of having an environment that is so saturated with these foods is that they're just so easy to get to. And they're very like socially acceptable, right? Because it's like the population, you know, it's it's the majority of our food supply. And so I think. Um, you know, that can certainly that, you know, we have seen that, you know, certain people have a tendency to um, cope with stress and negative emotions by, you know, using these types of foods. Right. Um, Which then could, I guess, distract from, you know, what is the, the, the core issue or the core reason for that person's mental state. And not to, not to suggest that it's personal responsibility because a lot of that could be dictated by society and just, you know, general inequities across society. But it's an interesting thing to kind of ponder. Mm-hmm.